Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how the Apostle Paul greets the Ephesians, and we echo those words to all of those climbing aboard the Bible bus with us now. I'm Steve Schwetz, welcoming you to another great study on Through the Bible. Now, in just a minute, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, is going to begin our lesson in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. So if you can, get your Bible open to Ephesians, and let's welcome Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president, to the studio today. Greg, did you bring us some fruit? <laughs> yes, I love to bring fruit, and it's uh, not the kind you eat physically, but uh, obviously we're talking about the fruit of what God is doing through our efforts to get his word out all across the world. And Dr. McGee says we should be fruit inspectors, and that's why we read these letters, one of many reasons. And we're so happy uh, today to focus on our fellow passengers in the U.S. and Canada. Yeah, here's the first one. This is from David in Los Angeles. Dear Greg, I grew up in a Christian home and was born again at age nine, but I am a prodigal. I sniffed glue, then smoked weed, and eventually abused alcohol. At 49, I got clean and sober through AA. My sponsor is a Christian and showed me AA's 12 steps in the Bible. While channel surfing, I found KKLA Christian Radio and heard an advertisement for the Bible bus. I've been a passenger ever since. I purchased a Bible from you guys and the flash drive. The manager of our hotel is a born-again Christian. I was busy one morning, and the Holy Spirit told me, to turn on the radio. I did because I'm learning to obey his voice. It was just in time for your morning program. Thank you for showing up just when I needed to listen to God. Here is my monthly tithe. My goodness. You know, and Steve, I just feel like I got a smile that you you couldn't wipe off of my face because this is why we do what we do. We just hold forth the word of God. We fling the seed. We're just putting it out there and then saying to the Lord, Lord, you have to do this kind of amazing uh, yeah. work and of transformation. Yeah, and I just want to also acknowledge our partner, KKLA. Yeah, yeah. 50,000 watts on the middle yeah. of the FM dial in one of the biggest markets in the country. Right. Thank you so much. Salem Broadcasting yeah. has always been so good at supporting us in the different markets, and we appreciate this, uh, this letter coming back. Yeah, and that also points out literally everything we hear when we hear about fruit, there is a chain of of people and networks and hard work. It isn't just those of us that through the Bible. Without our partnerships, we could not have the impact. And, and we are grateful for Salem and for KKLA. Now let's go to Arizona and hear from Roxanne. The Lord introduced me to the Bible bus in Revelation. This is my first trip. What a blessing each stop is on the tour. The Lord called me to himself in 1967 at the age of 11. In 2017, my mom died, which put me on a roller coaster of emotions. Sadness and loss overwhelmed me. I felt abandoned because my mom and dad were my best friends. My dad had died only three years before. Then 2020 came and so much confusion and chaos were happening in the world. It was a signal to me that something was happening. Pay attention. Intellectually, I understood the Lord allowed these things to happen, but for me, it was to get me to the point where I was completely dependent on him in my heart and in my spirit to be fully convinced that he is the Lord. The Bible bus was a much better vehicle at this time than the roller coaster. Ha <laughs> ha. That's a good joke. We like that. She goes on. May the Lord keep the Bible bus on schedule and on the road, ready to receive riders with each appointed stop along the way. Well, thank you so much, Roxanne, for that that letter to mm. us. Here's Natalie. She writes, I used to listen to Through the Bible on our car radio in Canada. Now I live in Mexico and listen on your app. Although I'm not fluent in Spanish, I give out the URL to the Spanish language programs to as many people as I can. Thank you for continuing and sharing what the Lord is doing all around the world. That's fantastic. And also, if you like to share with others, you can use our Bible bus passes. We Ooh, have yes. one that will... You click on a QR code, it takes you right to uh, the place you can download our app. Also, we have one for Dr. McGee's booklets, if people want to read, and one that shares the gospel. And if you can use those, just call 1-800-65-BIBLE, and we'll send them out to you. That's right. Now, let's pray as we begin our study. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to study Ephesians together. I pray that you would continue to use the ministry in North America to bless people, those listening in English all around the world, Lord. Please be with us in the study now in Ephesians. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now friends, as we return back here to the 
epistle to the Ephesians, as you can see, we're going to move rather slowly through this epistle. I feel very keenly that these epistles should be given top priority. Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, and we spent quite a bit of time with First and Second Corinthians. I feel like that these have a throbbing, personal, living message for you and me today, probably as no other portion of the Scripture does. In other words, when God said to Joshua, arise, go over this Jordan, I know he's not talking to me, but it has a special message for me, and it has a special interpretation, as I know it meant to Joshua, but to me it has an application. In fact, the epistle to the Ephesians is the Joshua of the New Testament, and we're going to see that as we come now to our study today. Now, we got down to verse 2 of chapter 1. We're not moving very fast. Now let me read, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to talk about this word grace a great deal in this epistle, and I'm going to pass by it with just a word or two. It was a word of greeting, and the word grace and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace was the Gentile form of greeting in that day. The word in the Greek was charis. Two men meet on the street, one would say to another charis. I was walking down the street in Athens with a Greek friend of mine who was a missionary, and he spoke to several people as we went by, and I said to him, it sounds to me like you greet them with the word charis. And he laughed, and he said, well, it's similar to it so that apparently today it's still a form of greeting. Grace be to you, and peace. Now, the word in the Gentile world, the pagan world, the secular world, was the word grace. Now, the word that is the religious word is the word peace. That is the word that you would hear in Jerusalem, shalom. Grace to you in peace, and Paul has given both of these words a wonderful meaning. In fact, the matter is he's lifted them to the height. And the grace of God is the means by which God saves us. We'll see that when we come to the second chapter here, and I'll talk about it then. But you must know the grace of God before you can experience the peace of God. And Paul always puts them in that order. Grace before you can have peace. And today, You see everywhere the word peace. Of course, what they're talking about is generally peace in some section of the world. Our world peace is what they're talking about. But the world can never know peace until it knows the grace of God. And the interesting thing is you don't see the word grace around very much. You see the word love. You see the word peace today. They are very familiar words. They are supposed to be taken from the Bible But they don't mean, when you see it on a bumper sticker of a car, it doesn't mean there what it means in the Word of God, and we'll have occasion to call attention to that. Now, this peace is peace, first of all, with God, because your sins are forgiven. And your sins can never be forgiven until you know something of the grace of God. Now, the grace and peace is from God our Father, and He becomes our Father when we experience the grace of God and regenerated by the Spirit of God, and it's from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is interesting. Doesn't Paul believe in the Trinity? Why didn't he say from the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit was in Ephesus, indwelling believers. The Lord Jesus was seated at God's right hand in the heavens, so that we need to keep our geography straight when we study the Bible. A great many people get their theology warped because they don't have the geography right. And when we get that straightened out, it even helps our theology. Now, will you notice we come to a marvelous verse here. It's verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places 
in Christ. Now, that is a very wonderful expression, but I'm going to change that just a little today. Blessed here be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. And you'll notice places are in italics in the text, in Christ. Now, we notice here that there's something that is very important here. He has blessed us. We praise him with our lips because he first made us blessed. And our blessing is a declaration. His blessings are deeds. We pronounce him blessed. He makes us blessed. Now, what does it mean, blessed? Well, the word has in it the thought of happiness and joy. God is rejoicing today, and God is happy today because he has a way of saving you, and he can bless you. And this is so wonderful. The fact of the matter is, I can't think of anything more wonderful than this. And he hath blessed us. Now, he's not speaking here something that may be ours when we get to heaven, but he's speaking of something that's ours right now. Somebody says to me, have you had the second blessing? Second blessing? Well, my friend, I'm working way up in the hundreds, back up in the thousands. I've not only had a second blessing, I've had a thousand blessings, by the way. And he's blessed us, and he's done it in Christ. And we're going to see that here because that's something else. And here we are, blessed with all spiritual blessings, and we should see this. It's in the heavenlies. I don't know exactly where the heavenlies are, but I do know where the Lord Jesus is. He's at God's right hand, and we're told here that these blessings are in Christ. Well, may I say to you that we need to be careful with this. He doesn't say here that these blessings are with Christ. Now, there are those that read it like that. Right now, you and I are seated in Christ. Somebody says, you go into heaven someday? The answer is, that's generally given. Well, I hope so. Well, let me say this to you. If you're going to heaven, you're already there in Christ. He's blessed you in the heavenlies, in Christ. And you're there, my friend, regardless of what your position is down here. You're in Christ. Why, your practice down here may not be good, but if you're a child of God, you're already in Christ. Now, some people even misunderstand it like this. I was teaching Ephesians not long ago in a conference, and they called on a brother at the end of the service to lead in prayer. And he got up and he says that, Lord, we just thank you that this morning we've been sitting in the heavenly places in Christ. Well, he missed the point again. We didn't have to come to a Bible study, as important as that is, and have our hearts thrilled with these great spiritual truths to be sitting in the heavenlies. The fact of the matter is, you're in the heavenlies in Christ. Even, my friend, when you're down in the dumps, you can be down in the dumps, but if you're in Christ, you're seated in him. That's something that he's done for us. Now, he's blessed. Blessed be the God and Father. We praise him. Why? Because he's blessed us. Now, he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And I want you to see something to me that is a tragic thing today, and it's this. The picture that's given, of course, is the book of Joshua, as we've said before, that the children of Israel were given the land of Canaan. And by the way, Canaan is not heaven. Canaan is a picture of where we live today. Canaan could never be heaven because there was enemies there to be fought. There was battles to be fought. And when you get to heaven, they won't be there. Down here is where the battle is being fought. And the interesting thing is this, God gave them the land, but he said to them, every place that your foot shall stand upon, that's going to be yours. That's what he told Joshua. 
But couldn't Joshua say, well, Lord, you've already given it to us. Let us walk in and take it. My friend, God has blessed us today with all spiritual blessings. We're in Christ. And have you ever stopped to think of what we have in Christ? Christ has been made unto us. He's been made sanctification, justification. I started out in a church as a boy working for my salvation. I didn't do very well with that. May I say to you, Christ is my justification. And then I got saved, and then I tried to work to be good. I didn't do very well at that either. And then I found out that Christ has been made unto me sanctification. May I say I've got everything in him, blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. Friends, you can't improve on that, can you? At least I don't think you can. All of that that you have in Christ. And when you come to Christ, you get everything in him. Don't come and tell me today that I have to wait later on and that I have to tarry and wait for the Holy Spirit to give me something special, a baptism or something. Well, my friend, I got it all in Christ. And that's when you say Christ is a curse. You say Christ is a curse when you say to me, I don't get everything in Christ. I got everything when I came to him. Now, there are two ways, though. You've got to lay hold of these possessions, your spiritual possessions. They're yours. I want to tell two stories today, and both of them are true. I was in Chicago many years ago, picked up the evening paper during the week, and this was a little clipping, a little article, and I clipped it out, that was on the front page, actually, of the paper, but way down at the bottom. Wouldn't apt to be noticed. And here was the byline, Chicago, June 9. The flop houses and saloons of Chicago's Skid Row were searched today for one Stanley William McKenna Walker, 50, an Oxford graduate and heir to half of an $8 million English estate. The missing persons detail hope that somewhere among the down and outers who line the curbs and sleep off wine binges in the cheap hotels they would find Walker, son of a wealthy British shipbuilder. And you know, when I read that, I thought how tragic it is. Imagine being an heir to a half of $8 million and being a wino that's sleeping in two-bit hotels in Chicago. My friend, I felt like sitting down and weeping for that poor fella to think that that was true of him. And then I got to thinking... Just think of the children of God today. They're living in cheap hotels. They are living off of the little wine of this world. And I don't mean that necessarily literally, but they engage in cheap entertainment down here. And they are wealthy beyond the dreams of Croesus. Imagine being blessed with all spiritual blessings and living like a pauper down here. And there are a lot of folk in our churches today living just like that. This was tragic. And later on, I was telling that story here in Los Angeles when I was past. And a lady came up to me afterward. She was a visitor from Chicago. She said, Dr. McGee, do you know how that, that story worked out? What really happened? I said, no, I never heard. She said, well, they found it. Oh, I said, well, that was wonderful. No, she said it wasn't quite so wonderful. She said they found him dead, sleeping in a doorway a cold night later on that fall in Chicago. Dead. And I thought, oh my, how tragic it is to live like that in this life. My, I tell you, to have that and to die like that man died. And a lot of Christians live and die just like that, and yet they're blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies, in Christ. Now, there's something else that we have in Christ, and I want to tell this other story, and this is a story that is also true. There was out west here years ago an heir to a British nobleman. He was one of the heirs, and he was also living in poverty, just eking out a struggling existence, and finally, when this nobleman died, well, they began to look for him, and they found him. And when they found him, they told him that he was the heir. 
And you know the great deal of publicity was made of it. You know what that fella did? Why, he believed it. <laughs> he went down to the clothing store, showed them the article, and the lawyer that had come to look for him and had found him why he was with him. And he said, I want the best suit of clothes you got. <laughs> and he bought a first-class ticket, returned back to England in style. You know why? He believed it. He believed that that was his. And he acted upon it. My friend, you can go either route you want to today. You can go first class as a Christian, or you can go down in the steerage. You can go second, third, fourth class. Now, a lot of Christians doing that today. But God wants you to know that you've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Now, he hasn't promised us physical blessings. He has promised us spiritual blessings. And these are in the heavenlies. They are in Christ. And you are not going to have any spiritual blessing in this life that doesn't come to you through Jesus Christ, my friend. That's just how important he is. He not only has saved us, but he is the one today that blesses us. Oh, how we need to lay hold to him in faith and start living as a child of God should live. Now we come here to this section that is very important. We have attempted to give you this outline before here. We have God the Father plan the church. See, you wouldn't even build a house today without a blueprint. At least I don't think you would. You'd be very foolish if you did build a house without a blueprint. And here we find that God the Father planned the church. Now, what did he do in planning for the church? Well, there are three things that are mentioned here. He chose us in Christ. And second, he predestinated us to the place of sonship. And third, he made us accepted in the Beloved. Now, I know that I've come here today to a passage of Scripture that's difficult. And it may be a good thing we're coming to the end of this period because I want you to gird up your loins or your mind next time to look at the strongest passage there is in the Word of God. We're going to talk about election. We're going to talk about predestination. And these are two words that are frightening. People run to cover when these words are mentioned. Why, you'd think that they're dirty words. But may I say to you, they're Bible words. And they mean something. And I hope we won't be extreme, but I think that we need to see here that it's something that's very important to see. He says here, according as he chose us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world in order that we should be holy and without blame before him. Now this verse and these verses that follow this, they're essentially the most difficult verses in Scripture to grasp. They are, first of all, let me say, they are repulsive to the natural man. And unfortunately, the average believer today finds them difficult to accept at face value. The statements are clear. The truth they contain is hard to receive. And I think these two verses are sort of like a wall, hard to crack, but there's a lot of goody on the inside. But we are going to see that next time in detail. But let me just add this further word, according to as, do you notice that? According as, and that's the connective which modifies the preceding statement. The spiritual blessings that you and I are given, they are in accord with the divine will. All is done in perfect unison with God's purpose. This world, my friend, and this universe is going to operate according to the plan and purpose of Almighty God. That's important for us to see. Now, we're going to leave off there today, but be with us next time as we go into this very difficult passage of Scripture. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
To get our hearts and minds ready for what we'll learn next time, why don't we read Ephesians 1 a few times? You'll be glad that you did. And to get our Bible reading schedule ahead of time, you can visit us at ttb.org. And better yet, why don't you subscribe to the newsletter mailing list and get the schedule every month? You can reach out to us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help. I'm Steve Schwetz. For all of us at Through the Bible, we're praying that you would know God's grace and peace today and every day as you walk with Him. Jesus made it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Our journey on the Bible bus today is supported by the prayers and gifts of fellow passengers as we travel through the Bible.